Today, let me discuss the concepts of sacred complex, great and little tradition, and tribe caste continuum used in Indian anthropology. The concepts of sacred complex, great and little traditions, caste tribe continuum, etc., have been used by Indian anthropologists in carrying out research on tribes, castes, villages, urban cities of both orthogenetic and heterogenetic natures. Sacred Complex The concept of sacred complex as a focus of anthropological investigation was put forth by L. P. Vidyarthi in 1961 in his book The Sacred Complex in Hindu Gaya. Vidyarthi tried to analyze the contribution and importance of traditional centers of Indian civilization in a systematic way. With the study of sacred and traditional Hindu Gaya, the concept of sacred complex came to light in anthropological literature. Marriott and Bernard S. Conn also developed the concepts of network and centers to study the channels of integration of Indian civilization wherein they discussed the similar theme conceptually. Since then, the concepts of sacred complex and networks and centers have become very popular theoretical models for studying the traditional places of pilgrimage and the religious complex of the simple societies in India as dimensions of Indian civilization. A sacred complex is an intricate and interdependent grouping of sacred centers, sacred performances and sacred specialists. Methodologically, the study of sacred complex unfolds channels of cultural transmission which helps in the integration of civilization. It has played an integrating role by providing a meeting place of different kinds of peoples and traditions, of castes and sects, of classes and statuses. The sacred complex, therefore, patterns culture. It also cultivates and promotes varieties of creative arts and literature and helps preserve the ideal types. It is a reality that binds us together against the geographical diversities and social and linguistic heterogeneities. The mechanism of sacred complex and the situation of pilgrimage are dependable and effective means of integration. Vidyarthi studied the sacred and great traditional Hindu Gaya and described three analytical concepts in detail. First, a sacred geography. Second, a set of sacred performances. Third, a group of sacred specialists. These three concepts conceived collectively are termed as sacred complex. Apart from the study of Gaya, Vidyarthi undertook short trips to sacred places like Banaras of Varanasi, Bhubaneswar, Puri, Diogar, and paid many visits to many rural temples and bathing centers. His study has opened up new interest among some other social anthropologists to take up the study of similar towns like Varanasi, Puri, Diogar, Raj Grihi, and Janakpur. These studies attempt to fill the gap in the study of traditional and sacred towns of Indian civilization. Great and Little Tradition The concepts of great tradition and little tradition were put forth by Redfield in his The Social Organization of Tradition. He states that in order to comprehend peasant culture, we must understand that it is not an autonomous unit, but it is an aspect or dimension of the civilization of which it is a part. That is why he calls the peasant society as part society and part culture. The peasant culture has an evident history. We are called upon to study that history and the history is not local. It is a history of the civilization of which the village culture is one local expression. 
In a civilization, there is a great tradition of the reflective view and there is a little tradition of the largely unreflective many. The great tradition is cultivated in schools or temples. The little tradition works itself out and keeps itself going into the lives of the unlettered in their village communities. The tradition of the philosopher, theologian and literary man is a tradition consciously cultivated and handed down. That of the little people is for the most part taken for granted and not submitted to much scrutiny or considered refinement or improvement. The two traditions are interdependent. Great tradition and little tradition have long affected each other and continue to do so. Great epics have arisen out of elements of traditional tale-telling by many people and epics have returned again to the peasantry for modification and incorporation into local cultures. Milton Singer has in his When a Great Tradition Modernizes focused on Redfield's concepts and their application in Indian contexts. While McKim Marriott discussed mainly the application of the concepts of great tradition and little tradition to the field of religion, Singer has applied to not only religion but also to agriculture and kinship. When an anthropologist studies an isolated primitive community, the context is that community and its local and immediate culture. When he comes to study a peasant community and its culture, the context is widened to include the elements of the great tradition that are or have been in interaction with what is local and immediate. If he is interested in the transformations that take place through this interaction, that is diachronic studies, he will investigate the communication of little and great traditions with each other and the changes that may have resulted or come to result in one or both because of the communication. Western anthropologists like McKim Marriott have tried to study the Indian peasant villages as they lie within Hindu, Muslim or modern Western civilization. In the village called Kishangarhi, which Marriott studied, the religion consists of elements of local culture and elements of the high Sanskrit tradition in close adjustment and integration. He finds evidences of accretion and of transmutation in form without apparent replacement and without rationalization of the accumulated and transformed elements. 15 out of 19 festivals celebrated in Kishangarhi are sanctioned in universal Sanskrit texts. But some of the local festivals have no place in Sanskrit teaching. Those that do are but a small part of the entire corpus of festivals sanctioned by Sanskrit literature Villagers confuse or choose between various classical meanings for their festivals and even the most Sanskritic of the local festivals have obviously taken on elements of ritual that arose not out of the great tradition but out of the local peasant life. Caste Tribe Continuum The gradual process through which a tribal group transforms itself into a caste group is designated as the caste tribe continuum. The concept of continuum owes its origin to Redfield when he published The Folk Culture of Yucatan in 1941. There are several characteristics that are common to tribes and castes and there are several characteristics that differentiate them from one another. In Indian anthropology, the problem of tribe caste continuum has attracted the attention of Indian ethnographers and census commissioners since the last decade of the 19th century. 
Many Census Commissioners of India faced the difficulties in deciding where the category of the tribe ended and caste began. Risley pointed out in 1891 and 1915 that it was difficult to draw a demarcating line between tribe and caste. He mentioned four processes by which the transformation of tribes into castes is effected. The processes are first, the leading men of an aboriginal tribe having somehow got on in the world and became independent landed proprietors managed to enroll themselves in one of the more distinguished castes. They usually set up as Rajputs, their first step being to rope in a Brahmin priest who invents for them a pedigree hitherto unknown. Second. A number of aborigines embrace the tenets of a Hindu religious sect, losing thereby their tribal name. Third, a whole tribe of aborigines or a large section of a tribe enroll themselves in the ranks of Hinduism under the name of a new caste, which, though claiming an origin by remote antiquity, is readily distinguished by its name. And lastly, a whole tribe of aborigines or a section thereof become gradually converted to Hinduism without abandoning their tribal designation. F. G. Bailey in 1960-61, however, presented a more systematic interactional mode for considering the position of the tribe vis-a-vis -vis caste as two ideal poles in a linear continuum. He argued that Whereas the tribe is typically organized on the basis of segmentary solidarity, the caste system is based on organic solidarity. While trying to assess the similarities and dissimilarities between a tribe and a caste and the various factors leading to the tribe-caste continuum, endogamy appears to be the chief characteristic feature that is common between a tribe and a caste. The modern development in the means of transport and communication has induced increased contact between members of various tribes and has weakened the laws of endogamy in both. According to Max Weber, when an Indian tribe loses its territorial significance, it assumes the form of an Indian caste. In this way, the tribe is a local group, whereas the caste is a social group. The caste originated in ancient Hindu society with a view to division of labor on the basis of profession and occupation. The tribe came about because of the evolution of community feeling in a group inhabiting a definite geographical area. It may be emphasized here that tribes are different from castes in so far as the former represent self-sufficient economic units whereas the latter are only subunits within a higher economic structure. According to D.N. Majumdar, the tribe looks upon Hindu ritualism as foreign and extra-religious even though indulging in it and in the worship of gods and goddesses, whereas in the caste, these are necessary parts of religion. The tribes of Madhya Bharat which are called Hindu and Kshatriya tribes are better acquainted with their own bonga than with the Hindu gods. There is greater consciousness of differences in status and rank in the caste than in the tribe. The caste is not a political association, whereas the tribe is a political association. The names of clans and castes are adopted from some saint or mythical savant. In the tribe, the clans are based on totemic names, which are in turn the names of animals, plants or natural objects and phenomena. In the caste, individuals generally pursue their definite occupations because they are stipulated in the caste system. In the tribe, individuals indulge in all kinds of work, productive and non-productive. Although there are several such differences between a tribe and a caste, there has been a gradual and silent change from tribe to caste. 
the high castes and the tribes are at two opposite ends of this Indian social structure. The intermediate rungs are filled by a large number of castes which have either progressed from the tribal stage or have fallen from a previous higher status by non-observance of customary rights and practices, by intermarriages forbidden by the caste code, by adopting new occupations and novel customs and by eating forbidden food. These intermediary castes are functionally similar to an industrial middle class. The maximum number of recruits is in the lowest rung of caste groups from tribes. As the tribals enter into the caste hierarchy, their attitude towards life undergoes significant modification. The importance of the blood bond and the kinship group is forced to the background. The common economy of the clan is superseded by the individual desire for gain and property. Money assumes an importance unknown in tribal society and the ties of moral obligation, duty and reciprocity give way to a nexus based on economic gain and self-interest. Older values are lost, the choice of leader and spouse is guided by the newly acquired values. The tribal elders are pushed to the background. The priests are required to satisfy a more exacting clientele and public opinion finds excuses for failures and new behavior patterns. Individuality becomes a virtue and a desire for social equality is manifested. The clan chief and sacerdotal head lose their importance and power. New customs find favor with the people and new prescriptions for their old melodies gain popularity with astonishing success. To conclude, the researches of Robert Redfield, Milton Singer and Mickey Marriott in India gave theoretical and methodological leads in understanding the folk and peasant communities in India as dimensions of Indian civilization. L.P. Vidyarthi tried to analyze the contribution and importance of traditional centers of Indian civilization in a systematic way. He described three analytical concepts like a sacred geography, a set of sacred performances and a group of sacred specialists which he collectively termed as sacred complex. Marriott and Bernard S. Conn developed the concepts of networks and centers to study the channels of integration of Indian civilization wherein they discussed the similar theme conceptually. Thus, in Indian anthropology, the concepts of sacred complex and networks and centers have become very popular theoretical models for studying the traditional cities and places of pilgrimage as a dimension of Indian civilization. The great and little traditions of India are being reinterpreted and their studies provide a new perspective to understanding Indian civilization. It led to the beginning of an anthropological approach to the study of civilization by studying great and little communities of various dimensions.